Well, good morning. Good to see you all. I'm Steve Buckingham, a member of this congregation. Many of you know I'm a lifelong UU. In fact, I grew up at the Atlanta Unitarian Church when Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was preaching at Ebenezer Baptist. I'm also a lifelong political and social activist, as well as a student of religious, political, and social history. Early on, though, I learned that political tribalism could lead to violence. When I was beaten up in my high school gym class for leading the local presidential campaign for that civil rights radical, Hubert Humphrey. After graduating college with a degree in political science, I earned a living working in all three branches of government, beginning with the legislative and judicial and executive branches. And I was also active in political campaigns and advocated before federal, state, and local government. <laughs> Thanks for the percussionist. <laughs> After passing the Maryland bar, I created my own legal and government relations practice and was able to prove to myself that I could be a successful state lobbyist for nonprofits without compromising my ethics or my deeply held UU values. I was especially proud to have been the paid lobbyist for free state justice when we got the anti-discrimination law for LGBTQ people passed in 2001. At the time, I was told that was a uh, career killer working for free state justice. When UUSJ, Unitarian Universalists for Social Justice, the capital area was formed in 2000, I served on its first board of directors and chaired its advocacy committee for five years. In 2005, I helped create the UU Legislative Ministry of Maryland. I've been on its board since then, and I've been its chair for the last seven years. Last year, I ran the statewide effort to UU the vote in Maryland, and I wrote a guidebook on how to talk to people who don't vote. In short, my lifetime of experience has given me an understanding of how change has happened and can happen in our society, what is possible, and what is counterproductive. I do not subscribe to the magical thinking about creating a class-based revolution that will make everything somehow okay. Nor do I think that all you need is love. However, we must bridge the political divides if we hope to save our democracy. And I firmly believe that love must be the driving force behind and a key component of any successful effort. How many of us have struggled with friends or family members who espouse beliefs that are at odds with ours? Beliefs that seem anathema to us. We don't understand them. We don't know how to talk to them. America has been sorting itself into red and blue camps geographically religiously and culturally for a long time. And, sorry to say it, but each side has become more extreme over time as they talk only to like-minded people. This is objectively true for both sides, regardless of who started it. Remember, it wasn't that long ago that many Democrats were openly pro-life or pro-gun. And others were not sure about marriage equality or trans rights or even concerned with Confederate statutes around the country. And only recently, there were Republicans who supported civil rights legislation. And some supported abortion, affirmative action, gun control, and trans rights. That's all changed. Each political camp now has leaders and media that perpetuate the division and feed a continuous stream of information that attacks the other side. The divide has grown in recent years, and it has become much more dangerous. Fortunately, thoughtful people on both sides are concerned about the divide and exhausted by the constant warfare between the opposing camps. The country singers I sang from today are an example. So what can we do? Many who have trouble understanding their political opponents find it easier to dismiss them as backwards, ignorant, gullible, or malevolent. It's not uncommon, even in UU circles, to denigrate our political opponents, treat them with contempt, call them crazy, 
stupid, or deplorable. Doesn't help. Not only helpful, unhelpful in swaying the persuadables and getting progressive policies passed, it harms both them and us. Dr. King spoke eloquently about how contempt breeds hatred, triggers hatred in others, and destroys those who act from hate and contempt. In particular, we need to stop reflexively accusing others of racism and sexism. We need to recognize that others may not be as informed or aware as we are of America's history of oppression and stop ascribing evil intent to actions or statements that are often more ignorant than intentional. A statement or action does not need malicious intent to harm another. Let me be clear about that. But lack of intent should make a difference in how we handle it. Raising awareness of actions that offend or harm others is different from attacking someone as a racist. And it can be counterproductive. When we do this to our own potential allies, and I've seen this happen, it insists on a level of purity that is unattainable, even by ourselves. As Carl says, we're saved from perfection but it insists on a level of purity that we can't even attain, and it looks like we're more interested in showing how right and how woke we are at the expense of well-meaning people who make a mistake. Even worse, when it's done to political opponents, it triggers anger, resentment, and even hatred, and prevents any real discussion of issues. Another mistake we make is failing to listen or even attempt to understand opponents' situations and grievances. A liberal upper middle class person may have strong feelings about certain media and politicians, but be oblivious to how recent history has affected many working class people who have watched those media and supported those candidates. The 2008 recession you know, forget about that, don't we? It created historic levels of home loss, job loss, and undermined the common belief that every succeeding generation would have it better than those before. Minorities might be used to struggling with political and economic systems that put them at a disadvantage, but many whites had never experienced that threat of significant economic loss or the need to overcome hardship. And studies have shown that people who lose something, whether it be money, home, job, privilege, or dignity, often feel it, or always feel it, more acutely than if they never had those things at all. And the threat of loss can be traumatic. Evidence of the impact can be found in the huge spike in both drug addiction and suicide among white males and a corresponding average drop in lifespan for the first time. Cultural changes have also been occurring rapidly, pushed a lot of times by progressives. Participation in organized religion has been dropping, while the traditional roles they taught and values regarding sex, sexual education, sex orientation, and gender identity have continued to evolve in the public culture. There's also been a growing awareness, especially since last year, of the systemic racism in the national culture, revealing very uncomfortable truths. But when beliefs and institutions that help define a person's social cir circles and their identity are falling away or changing, they can easily think that their way of life is threatened. While loss of white privilege is certainly a part of this, it's not the whole story. And we do people a disservice if we make no attempt to listen to their personal experiences. There is a culture war because the culture is changing. And many feel adrift without the long-standing institutional anchors that kept them moored. The alternative is to reach out to political opponents 
reduce their fear, and engage in constructive dialogue. We must cross the divide and begin the healing. The fact is that those who are trying to undermine our democracy rely on the blind following of millions to support their actions. If we can undermine this support in the larger community, we can deny extremists the power they seek. That's my premise. Understanding some of the reasons for opponents' beliefs is a start in making peace with them. But we also have to know how to talk to them. It may seem a daunting task to engage with political opponents, but there are ways to do it that are actually relatively easy to follow. Dr. John Gottman, a famous social psychologist, set forth four rules to heal relationships. This is usually couples, but focus on other people's distress and focus on it empathic, empathetically. When others are upset about politics, listen to them respectfully. Try to understand their point of view before offering your own. Never listen only to rebut. Two, in your interactions with others, particularly in areas of disagreement, adopt the five to one rule. Make sure you offer five positive comments for every criticism. Three, no contempt is ever justified. Even if in the heat of the moment, you think someone deserves it. It is unjustified more often than you know. It is always bad for you, and it will never convince anyone that she is wrong. Four, go where people disagree with you and learn from them. Get outside our bubble. That means making new friends and seeking opinions you know you don't agree with. How to act when you get there? See rules one to three. I would also add to Dr. Gottman that we need to avoid saying anything that will trigger defensiveness, fear, or anger. Stay away from terminology that could feel threatening to your opponent. Slogans like defund the police and abolish prisons may thrill progressives, but their direct and literal meaning scares many people, including many moderates and liberals, including a majority of African Americans, the polls show. There is a reason that Maryland's African American Speaker of the House, Adrian Jones, did not couch her strong police reform proposals that passed this year in terms of defunding the police. Could have killed him. In his book, Thank You for Arguing, Jay Heinrich says, fear compels people to act and compulsion precludes a choice. No argument there, only naked instinct. The last thing we need is highly motivated opponents taking action out of fear, even if we think the fear is unreasonable. Insurrection, voting, those are ways to act. Best to avoid triggering fear in any way. As a positive strategy, Move away from talking politics and politicians and about ish, focus on issues instead. Many people, you might not be surprised, many people who express a contrary ideology also support many progressive issues and policies. Stop talking about what group you identify with and start talking policies. One way to do this, Heinrich suggests, is to move every conversation from the past tense through the present tense to the future tense. The past tense involves conversations about blame. Who did what terrible thing? Benghazi. <clears throat> we use the present tense to talk about values. That is wrong, this is right. The present tense involves what is important to you and it can be helpful to clarify respective positions. But it's not usually enough to reach agreement. 
To do that, you have to move to the future tense because that is a deliberative discussion because it involves choices. Where do we go from here? How do we solve this problem? There's real discussion there. If your conversation, for example, starts with accusations about how awful your site is or how they messed up a particular issue, you can start talking about what you believe in, a value statement in the present tense. Then you can ask your political opponent how they would go forward to solve the problem. Look for places where you can agree. There is nothing wrong with conceding a fact or an idea that they express, but then use them to make your own point. I recently had a discussion with a relative who stated he didn't think we needed more to remove Confederate statues or rename military bases. His reason? It's history. I agreed. It's history. Those people were part of history, but they betrayed their country and fought to preserve slavery. And I could see how African Americans would feel resentment that the country they fought now honored them. He conceded the point. Another tactic, especially good when dealing with bullies, is to ask questions. Sometimes the only practical response is to get them to challenge their own assumptions. Don't strike back. Undermine their opinions by getting them to think about how they define their terms. To ask these questions effectively, though, you need to make your opponent believe that you are being open-hearted and respectful. Keep in mind that the most hateful opinions are held by good people. Ask your questions as a friend. Love can conquer all. At the very least, you'll make people comfortable assumptions a little less comfortable. At best, your agreeable stances help you achieve the nirvana of argument, agreeability. Now, what do you do when you don't feel the love? In his book, Love Your Enemies, Arthur Brooks says, your opportunity when treated with contempt is to change at least one heart, yours. You may not be able to control the actions of others, but you can absolutely control your reaction. You can break the cycle of contempt. You have the power to do that. How? <laughs> Fake it. Act as if you felt loving. Ironically, studies have shown that it is what we do that most often determines how we feel, not the other way around. I'll repeat that. It is what we do that most often determines how we feel, not the other way around. In his best-selling classic, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey said, love is a verb. Love, the feeling, is a fruit of love, the verb. Love is something you do, sacrifices you make the giving of self. Love is a value that is actualized through loving actions. And as Brooks says, you don't have to feel uh, unity and brotherhood. We simply need to act in a spirit of unity and brotherhood and the feelings will follow. By the same token, if we allow ourselves to indulge in habits of contempt, frowning as we listen to talk radio, getting angry at the latest outrageous statement from a politician, our emotions will follow those actions as well. Also, show gratitude. Gratitude is quite simply a contempt killer. You cannot have contempt for someone who, to whom you are grateful. So be thankful for any meaningful dialogue and demonstrate respect and concern. Contrary to common belief, familiarity breeds compassion, not contempt. Familiarity breeds compassion, not contempt. I can tell you that this works since I've done it successfully. 
even with family members. There are also several groups that sponsor opportunities for posing signs to have meaningful dialogue. America Talks held a national week of conversation in June, and some of the members of our congregation participated. Raise your hand. You did, All right? Okay. There's also the Listen First Project. Sound familiar? The Civic Health Project and Common Ally, whose slogan, by the way, is screw politics, this is about issues. I've also conducted training in deep canvassing to encourage people to encourage, uh, to engage people and encourage voting, and there are many ways to get started. The point is, if we want to overcome the barriers that separate us from political opponents, we must engage them. To bridge the great divide, we can and must stop saying and doing things that trigger anger and fear in others and instead actively listen to their stories, ask questions to learn not to rebut, talk about issues in the future tense, and show them the same respect, gratitude, and love that we show our allies and friends. Think what that could do for those contentious family conversations. It has already helped mine. 